Hello, welcome back. We're getting ready to start learning about the book of Ephesians today. And when we look at the book of Ephesians, there's a couple of questions that we can think about that would apply to the Ephesian church at the time when Paul wrote this letter, as well as the church today. In particular, the theme that we're going to look at with the book of Ephesians, kind of a two-part theme, is going to be mystery revealed. We'll explain what that means, as well as darkness versus light. And also, we'll explain what that means. But behind those things, we want to think about what difference does faith make? What difference does the work of the Holy Spirit that changes a person's heart, who was formerly unregenerate or dead in sin, to somebody who knows new life because of the work of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel? What difference should that make? Paul is going to talk to the Ephesians about how their salvation, the encounter they had through the Holy Spirit, something that God had ordained for them before the beginning of time, how all that is going to radically change how they act, how they think, how they live, how their families look. So we want to think today, well, how much should Christians look different today? Now, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he was writing to people who are in a thoroughly pagan culture, who pursued all sorts of pagan practices and just sinful practices. We've talked already when we studied the books of First and Second Corinthians about the pervasive sexual immorality in the ancient Greek world. That's certainly going to be a problem in the context of the Ephesians. But today, in American culture especially, you could say, well, there's a lot of things about Christianity that have sort of rubbed off on our culture in general, which is probably true. Nevertheless, to be culturally American and to be culturally Christian may not necessarily be the same thing. So the question that we're going to look at in your homework, uh, you'll see the sheet on Google Classrooms, will allow you to sort of think about that a little bit. How much different should Christians be from those who live around them who aren't necessarily professing Christian faith, or at least aren't really making an effort to pursue it? It's just kind of like, well, you know, by default, I guess I'm Christian. So how much should, should Christians be different? One of the things where this book is going to take us is to think about the formation of marriage and family as well, especially in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to focus on that actually in the next video after this one. This video only will take us through the first half of Ephesians 5. But Paul is going to describe what Christian marriage looks like, what its meaning is, and so, again, it's an opportunity for us to think about, well, what should be different about Christians and their approach to things like marriage or family? How much should the church emphasize those differences today? How much should Christians make a point to distinguish ourselves by how we live in families, this sort of thing? So we're going to think about that more in the homework, and as we look at Ephesians itself, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started looking at a clip here that gives sort of a nice visual overview of Ephesians. Again, if you're a visual learner, you'll appreciate this. And then I'm going to take us through and highlight some key passages from the first five or so chapters of Ephesians. Again, we're going to cover more of chapter five in our next video. Let's go. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story personally, in our neighborhoods and communities, and in our families. So let's dive in, and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish-style poem where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purposed to choose and bless a covenant 
people. And think here, the family of Abraham and Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. He says in chapter 1 verse 10 that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham long ago. Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then here at the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about but personally experience the power of the gospel, that they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter 1, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus's resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This time he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's Spirit to simply grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. The second half of the letter begins with Paul shifting gears, and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one. And one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people, but they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple. And the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, 
New humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflicts. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, new humans come under the influence of God's Spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. The first two have to do with singing, singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting that the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's followers, we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus' body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians to begin to form habits, proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. Very powerful. It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. So in contrasting the experience of the Jews and the Gentiles, as we read in the New Testament, it's kind of this interesting situation where the Jews, who should have seen what was coming as far as the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the apostles, and then you have the Gentiles who could not have seen all this coming because they had no background in the prophecy of the Old Testament, And yet, between the two, the Gentiles were much quicker, again, by God's grace, much quicker to accept and understand what was being revealed. And that's where we come to this theme in Ephesians of the mystery being revealed. And we can see that right here in chapter 1, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he, God, set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So what Paul is saying is that, hey, you Ephesians, you Gentile community living in sin and spiritual darkness, you know, all along, before the beginning of time, in fact, God had anticipated not only your need for salvation, but had orchestrated it and decided that when the time was right, in the fullness of God's time, this mystery would be revealed and the gospel would be brought to Ephesus and the people who are now in this church would come to know Christ. And he talks about this in terms of God's long time purpose. In him, God, we have obtained an inheritance. You can see a a reflection there or an echo of what Paul's already said about our inheritance, especially from Romans chapter 8, which we studied already, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Again, you could see more echoes of Romans 8, where it talks about God working all things together uh, for those who love him. And it's this idea, again, 
that you know now we are revealing that God had had this plan in the works for millennia and now is the time when it's being re revealed who knew again in contrast to the experience of the Jews who had you know all sorts of prophecies and scriptures saying oh yeah it's something you know they didn't know exactly when but yeah there's going to be a savior in fact you know before Jesus came they knew wh which town he was going to show up in and they knew some information about the things he would do and that information allowed Jesus to confirm that he was in fact the Christ the Gentiles had no such benefit and so Paul is just so thrilled to reflect on this mystery revealed he continues in the next part here of chapter 1 which is this poetic passage continued and it describes the knowledge that the Ephesian Christians have or the process of getting that knowledge is like having the eyes of your hearts enlightened and when you think of the word enlightenment it has this sense of coming to know a great new and important truth or vision for reality you know if you look at people who pursue even like Eastern philosophies you know what does the what does the wise rogue sage go up the mountain to do to to gain enlightenment well in this case Paul is saying that through the work of the Holy Spirit these people have had the eyes of their hearts enlightened and therefore they may know what is the hope which to which he has called you God has called you which are the riches of his glory and the inheritance again inheritance in the Saints so they are now able to understand that hey not only uh, you know is there this Savior named Jesus who came and died for sinners but we are called to be part of the inheritance that he is going to share with all those who put faith in him again Gentiles just no way that they saw this coming and so he reflects on the greatness and power that this shows and how Christ worked through this process and now that he's been raised from the dead there's this sort of assurance of all the things that are part of the inheritance verse 22 and he put all things under his feet and gave him he as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all so the plan had been for Christ to be put as the head of everything and for these Gentiles to be included in this wonderful inheritance showing God's power and glory we're going to see that idea of headship show up again actually in our discussion of marriage in our next video from Ephesians 5 but there's this picture of Christ coming to being the head of the church fulfilling this great uh, promise that was made in the gospel this next section here from Ephesians chapter 2 is where Paul emphasizes just how distant the Ephesian people were from the gospel and from salvation before the work you know ultimately of the Holy Spirit through Paul's preaching that brought them to salvation therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles right not Jews people of no background in Jewish culture and scriptural knowledge that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision this reflects that Jewish distinction remember in the Old Testament the Jews were commanded by God it was Abraham who received this command commanded by God to receive the sign of circumcision which is a, a physical process and so the Jews distinguish themselves well we're the ones who are circumcised those Gentiles they're the ones who are not and so Paul says well you who certainly from a Jewish point of view are the outsiders at least in terms of this physical sign remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the Commonwealth of Israel so these people had they would you know they would not have been welcome in the land of Israel and if you remember your Old Testament history God's word to his people was to keep the outside people out in fact generally when outsiders became deeply involved inside Israel it led to big problems for instance when Solomon couldn't help himself and kept marrying foreign wives 
and it says that they turned his heart away from the Lord and there was all sorts of issues so you know that's we look at that from the Jewish point of view but here if you think about it from the Gentile point of view well spiritually speaking they're kind of out of luck they're alienated from the Commonwealth of Israel and therefore strangers to the covenants of promise they don't have access to the scripture they don't know what it said in Genesis about Abraham being the father of a great nation and that in him all nations would be blessed they, they have no no sense of what promise of salvation comes through the covenants that God made with Israel and so it says here they were having no hope and without God in the world in a sense cut off from any source of true light uh, you know they had thrown back on all sorts of vain religions false philosophy and so it goes verse 13 but now in Christ you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ he reached out to these people through his blood to reconcile them and is skipping down here so making peace he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility you know if, again if you read the Old Testament like a lot of the history is about fighting between the Jews and the Gentiles and those wars now can come to a cease because Christ has reconciled both the Jews and the Gentiles to God through his blood and that way peace works vertically between man and God and horizontally between man and man as we move into chapter 3 Paul reflects on his place and as we heard before his his excitement at being part of this and so he's going to continue to say that you know the mystery was made known to be to me by revelation so revelation that work of the Holy Spirit whereby God's will for man's salvation is revealed so the revelation that Paul's talking about would involve certainly what Paul is able to read from the Old Testament and also he's an apostle and has received direct word from God he makes references to that in uh, several places and he was directly called by God for instance to do the ministry that he did in Ephesus so he says well you know God revealed to me that this was supposed to happen I was going to be a means of grace he was going to be a minister of this happening and so he says when you read this you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. So Paul is saying here, hey, this was not information that we had before like today. You know, your parents and grandparents, my parents and grandparents, we did not know that Ephesian pe people would end up being part of God's covenant. Like that's the new big reveal here. Not known in previous generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that's the ultimate reveal. Gentiles are part of the work that Christ accomplished. This is not a Jews only issue, but this is for all people, including the Gentiles. And this revelation comes through the work of the Spirit. And we did have some indication of this in the Old Testament in prophets like Isaiah and again you can see all the way back in Genesis when the writer of Genesis explains that through Abraham all nations would be blessed but obviously the really specific revelation comes now here in the first century when we see actual specific Gentiles putting their faith in Christ and therefore being reconciled to men and to God so Paul says that this revelation ought to make a change in the lives of the Ephesians. So he's saying, okay, we now know that this mystery has been revealed and that it has this significant piece of new information about you guys, you Ephesian Christians, you Gentile Christians, and therefore there should be a difference between your old life before you knew the mystery and your new life after you've been enlightened 
in the knowledge of Christ and had your wills and hearts changed by the Holy Spirit. And so here in chapter 4, he sort of explains a bit of this contrast and says that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. If you remember back in Romans, Paul talks about people who have suppressed the truth of God. Remember, the, the, the deal here isn't that Gentiles are just purely unaware of what the Bible says. In Romans, Paul points out that humans, as people made in God's image, are like designed to be God-knowers, and that they can even understand invisible attributes of God through what they can see in creation. So these Gentiles have lost knowledge of God by suppressing it, and therefore their hearts are darkened and their minds are futile. They, their philosophy is based on this suppression of truth, and therefore it's not effective, and it creates falseness and destruction. They are darkened in their understanding, it says here in verse 18, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. So the ignorance is not purely because they didn't have information available, but it's because of the hardness of heart. There's a problem in their very hearts or wills. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So in suppressing what is good, they have reveled in what is wicked. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Right? It was not through pursuing sensuality, through hardness of heart, that these Gentiles stumbled upon the truth of Christ and the gospel. No, that came in a very different way. So he says, because you have this truth in Jesus, verse 22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on a new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So there ought to be this moment where they can say, here's where I put off my old self, dominated by the desires of my sinful nature, and I put on a new self, which is created by the work of the Holy Spirit, made in the likeness of God, it's based on truth, not futility of mind. It's based on life, not death. And so this is where he's calling them to be different. Do not do the things you used to do. Do not think the things you used to think. Do not say the things you used to say. He's going to emphasize this with a few particular focus points, starting here in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we, we read about the application with regard to sexual morality. This was a huge problem in the ancient world. Unfortunately, it's also a huge problem in the modern world. And he says, But sexual immorality and all impurity, or covetousness, must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. So how distant should people who are changed by the Holy Spirit keep themselves from sexual perversion. It's not that they're like, well, you know, I can look at stuff, I can think about stuff, but, you know, I'm going to draw some lines in the sand and I just won't do certain things. And, no. He's saying it should not even be named among you. And I think you would extend that to say, well, you know, you know, obviously you're not reveling in conversations about things that are improper with other Christians, and certainly within your own heart and mind, you're putting these things away. But it says in verse 4, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. I know that when I was young, I often found that if you told a joke that was like a little bit off color or edgy, especially this was when, like when I was in college and you know not, not living in my home anymore, I found that if you told these things, you could get other college guys to laugh and sort of think you were pretty cool. But as I grew older and the Holy Spirit worked on me, I kind of realized, uh, like that's 
you know, from a biblical point of view, that's just not acceptable. And for, you know, frankly, from uh, the point of view of humor, um, coarse humor is like the unfunny person's way of being funny, because there's really nothing clever about it. You're just proving that you have a more perverted mind than other people, and you know, isn't that so? Isn't that so funny? Um, ultimately, it's not really all that funny. It's just sad. So, what he's saying here is that crude joking is a little bit of a reflection of a crude heart or a heart that still clings with some fondness to sinful perversion. He says there should not be this crude joking. There should not be the fruit of even a little bit of perversion in our conversation, even in the form of crude joking. These things are out of place. They don't make sense. I know one of the one of the things that you know you can see if you hang around people who are not believers or who are you know fairly uncommitted to faith or something like that and they generally will fall into kind of crassness filthy language and uh, even these people if they if you meet them and you say oh I'm a Christian like they actually sometimes will become like almost ashamed of their filthy language and usually do a bad job of trying to clean it up because they sense that it's out of place Right? And we should have that attitude as well. This sort of thing is out of place. We should instead have thanksgiving. Does this mean that Christians can't be funny? Certainly not. But it means that our humor should not be based on finding joy in perversion. Paul says in verse 5, You may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, like loving something over God basically, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, does this mean that if you've ever told a dirty joke, you don't get to go to heaven? No, that's not what this means. But the point is, he says, these things are improper, both in this life as a Christian, and are not at all part of the inheritance that you're going to get in God. These sort of things, and the people who are committed to these things, are not part of that inheritance. Verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Right? It is, on, it is on account of the perversion of sin in the world that God has to bring wrath in the first place. So it's really not like a funny thing to make light of what ends up being the cause of damnation. Like it's not a, it's not a ha-ha sort of thing. It's terrifying. Therefore, right... Therefore, because of all that, therefore, do not become partners with them. That is, people who practice and make light of such things. For at one time you were darkness. You're referencing their pre-conversion past. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, you can see this echo all the way back to Romans chapter 12. Test and see what is pleasing to the Lord, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. So the works of darkness are unfruitful because they don't accomplish any of the goals for which Christ came to save you. Right? They don't bring you into a better state of holiness. They don't help you reflect God's glory don't take part in things that are not are not pulling their weight as far as the main goals for your salvation but instead expose them for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret so the christians are not to pretend like ooh filthiness doesn't exist be be prudes or naive or aloof doesn't mean that it means that we are to see these things for what they are perversions that have provoked god's wrath and prevent us from bearing the fruit which is the object of our salvation and so take no part in these works of darkness but instead expose them because now we have the truth or the light that comes with the gospel so as you're thinking ahead to the test that we're going to do on this material you want to have the idea of Ephesians and that darkness into light or mystery revealed those are going to be important things for you to remember as you look at your homework, you want to be thinking about the issue of, well, what differences should being a Christian make? 
and how much different should Christians be? And I want you guys to think about that, you know, especially in terms of your homework, and I'll acknowledge it is kind of a tricky question, especially for people who are involved in church communities or Christian schools, because it kind of feels like sometimes, at least for some perhaps, that, well, actually, if you stood out, that would probably mean because you're not doing what you're supposed to do if you're in like a Christian or Christianized community. But it's always worth evaluating, well, what kind of differences should this make? How seriously are we taking these sort of things? And what kind of changes would there be between me without the work of the Holy Spirit and me with that work of the Holy Spirit? And it's a good thing for Christians at every stage of your Christian life to sort of come back to that question and be like, well, where was I? Where am I now? Where do I need to be? Where do I need to be going? And what's the difference between like the work of the Holy Spirit and that old self not based on that work. So those are questions that you can start to ponder and even it would be very useful to pray about them uh, just as a, an aspect of Christian growth. And then the other one that we'll talk about, especially in our next video more, is focusing more on that qu question of marriage. And I would say certainly today what uh, the church teaches about marriage and sexuality and all that sort of thing is increasingly out of step with culture. And I'd say, you know, 50 to 100 years ago, that wasn't so much the case. Not that there were no differences, but today there's some pretty glaring differences. So we'll think about, well, how much should the church be f making a big point of this sort of thing? And there's a range of perspectives, even within people uh, who are part of Christian communities, some saying, oh my goodness, this is the crusade that we must fight and reclaim the sanctity of marriage and the biblical truth be behind gender and sexuality, and other people who are less interested in fighting that kind of cultural war and focused more on, you know, the uh, aspects of love and reconciliation. And so you could think about, well, what should a church look like today with regard to some of those questions? And we'll, we'll take another look at that in our next video and look at what Ephesians 5 says about it, and we'll draw in some other passages. In the section we're studying for this test, it's going to be the books of Ephesians and Colossians that speak to marriage. Both of them are going to do that. We'll also pull in some other passages, but uh, that, that sounds like a good test question. Which two books from this set of four talk about marriage? That would be Ephesians and Colossians. Anyway, getting ahead of myself. Go ahead and complete the homework assignment. Again, remember that you just submit the, uh, you can type onto the doc that's shared with you and then um, use that as your submission and I'll get it and that'll, that'll work well. I think most of you guys are getting the hang of this. Let me know if you have any questions or problems and uh, we'll see you at the next video.